Hi, uh, thank you everyone for coming to, uh, to our talk today. I'm Steven, this is Gun. Uh, this presentation is based on joint work with our colleague Hai Zhou, who is not on stage today. Uh, most data are born at the continuous stream. They typically land in Kaf uh, message queue like Kafka first. Then stream processing engine like Flink can read data from Kafka and commit them to Iceberg data lake. In the stream injection path, data can commit to Iceberg every a few minutes, maybe. Let's zoom in a little bit to see how Flink Iceberg Sync works internally. First, we have the parallel writers. They process the records and then write them into data file like Parquet. When Flink checkpoint comes, the writers will flush the data file and upload them to distribute file system. Then the writer sends the metadata about the files, like location of the file, to the commit operator. The commit operator always runs with parallel one. When the Flink checkpoint finished successfully, the commit operator then commit a list of collect data files to Iceberg. This in a nutshell how Flink Iceberg Sync works, and it works well for many use cases for the streaming injection to the Iceberg. So what is the problem we're trying to solve here today? Many iceberg tables are partitioned by time, like hourly or daily. Time partition table can support time range query effectively using partition-based pruning. For some use cases, this time needs to be event time. By event time, we refer to the time that the events are generated, probably on the device side. With event time, data can come in late. Hours late, days, weeks, months. There are multiple reasons for the delay. Could be buffering on the device side. It also could be the delay on the backend pipeline. If we plot the traffic volume distribution across event hours, let's say hour zero will be the current hour, and hour one will be the previous hour. Typically, hour zero contains the most data and R1 contains the second most data. As we go further back in time, there are less and less data. That's why it's called a long tail pattern. In Iceberg, data file cannot, can only contains records from the same partition. That's how the partition-based file pooling can be efficient. That means all the uh, all data file can only contain the record from the same event hour. With that, let's do some calculation to see how many data files we're gonna generate every hour. Let's assume the table is the partition hourly, and uh, we also assume the event time range is capped at 10 days. If the event time range is longer, then we have even worse problems, small file problems. So that means every writer can process records from 240 partitions or 240 hours. Because every partition is a data file, so every writer can op open 240 files. We assume the writer parallelism is 500. That means every Flink checkpoint cycle, the committer can collect 120,000 files. Oops, sorry. So if we assume the Flink checkpoint intervals every five minutes, that means every hour we have 12 Flink, check, Flink checkpoint and 12 commits to the table. So we're talking about 1.4 million data files every hour. That's a lot of files for one hour of data. And because the long tail hours have very little traffic, this can also lead to small file problems. Here we plot the data file size histogram on one of the data set, you can see 75% of files are less than 77 kilobytes. Those are very, very small files in the big data world. But what are the implications of too many small files? First, cloud storage is typically optimized for throughput. Right? They can stream the bytes out at very high speed, but they are not optimized for low latency. 
the cost to open a file stream that to retrieve the first bytes is typically actually pretty high. So if we have a lot of small files, it can hurt the read throughput. Second, a lot of cloud storage, they have uh, API read limit per storage shard. If the ISO writer created too many small files, we can, uh, we can get the, the request can get throttled by the storage. So if we use a column or any file format like a parquet, it typically have pretty significant memory footprint. For example, parquet can buffer one row group size of data record in memory. A row group could be 128 megabytes. If every writer task needs to open hundreds of parquet files, that can lead to significant memory pressure and possibly out of memory error. Fourth is that when the flink checkpoint comes, right, the writer needs to flush the records and upload them to the distributed system storage. If the writer needs to flush hundreds of files, even though they are small files, that can still take quite a bit of time. That can increase the flink checkpoint duration. And this is the synchronous part of the flink checkpoint, which means during the synchronous part of the flink checkpoint, the pipeline is actually paused, not processing records. So that can also hurt the throughput. Last, if the iceberg needs to check over 1 million data files for one hour of data, that's a lot of metadata for iceberg. It definitely stress the metadata system in iceberg. So yeah, we are in kind of all those problems in, uh, in the event time budget table. So you may wonder why don't we use the Flink key by, using key by in the Flink, you can do a hash shuffle. By we can do a key by on the event hour. You can has shuffled the data by the event hour. This will definitely reduce the number of data files because all the records for the same event hour is processed by a single writer task. Right, that's great. But uh, here are the problems. As we mentioned earlier, the traffic are not even distributed across the event hour. They follow the long tail pattern. Second, even if let's assume the traffic is even distributed across the event hour, when we do a key by on low cardinality column, by low cardinality we mean that the unique number of keys is, is let's say is not much higher than the writer parallelism. In the GitHub uh, PR discussion, we'll link it below. This uh, demonstrate when we do a key by on the iceberg bucketing column, it'll result in uneven distribution of the traffic. The takeaway is that we need a smarter shuffling than a simple key by hash shuffle. Similarly, we can also use shuffle to input data clustering for non-partition columns. For example, when we, if we, when we can input the data clustering, then the data files can contain tight uh, value, uh, value ranges, which means the, when we use the min max column level statistics from iceberg to do file pruning, when you have the tight value range, they can be very effective compared to your, when the file, data file contains a very wide value range. Yeah, due to the time constraint, we're not gonna dive detail into the uh, non-partition data. If you come from the big data world, you may be familiar with uh, maintenance jobs to compact the small files or sort the data files for better data clustering. If we use the analogy of remediation versus prevention, those maintenance jobs, they are like a remediation approach. It tends to, remediation tends to be more expensive. In this case, it involves downloading a file, read the data files, compact them or sort them, then write the new data files out, then upload to the distributed storage again. The solution we described here is a more preventive approach, which had to add a streaming shopping stage before the iceberg writer to improve the data clustering. Second, those maintenance jobs won't solve the problem we talk about in the upstream injection path, the stream injection path to the iceberg. For example, the sorting issue. Right? That, when you do the compaction afterward, it won't help. So the compaction can also be tricky for event time per table because as I mentioned earlier, data can come in late, days, weeks, months. So we may need to recompact old partition over and over again because late data can keep coming in. 
So it can get a little more complicated to manage those compaction. With that, I hope you have a good understanding of the problem we're trying to solve. Now I'm going to go into some of the high-level design points. The key idea is to introduce a smart shuffling stage before the ice wall riders. There are two steps. First, we're going to calculate the traffic st statistics. For example, the shuffle task can calculate the local statistics. The local statistics could be, let's say, for every event hour, how many records it have seen. Right? It's kind of like a traffic distribution. Then the traffic uh, shuffle task can send those local statistics to the shuffle coordinator. The shuffle coordinator runs on the Flink Draw Manager, which is a kind of driver if you're supposed to with Spark. So it's, uh, the shuffle coordinator then can do the global aggregation. The benefit of the global aggregation is that because all the shuffle tasks, they may have different view of the data. If they have a skewed view, then you don't want to make, to make a different shuffle decision. So now we, we aggregate the global statistic then the shuffle coordinator can broadcast the globally aggregated statistic to the, all the shuffle tasks. Now all the shuffle tasks, they can make the same shuffle decision based on the same global statistics. The second step is actually shuffle. How do we actually shuffle the data based on the traffic statistic we just calculated? Because that statistic will guide our shuffle decision. So this is kind of a code snippet of the thin code. You can say we can add a custom partitioner after the shuffle operator to actually shuffle the data. A partitioner interface in Flink is then giving a key and the number of partition. Number of partition is the essential number of downstream uh, subtasks. So basically, you select a downstream task to output to this, uh, this record to. Basically, select a downstream channel to send the output. This is basically the interface of partitioner. We can use a range partition to split the sorted values. Let's say the sorted value will be even all, all zero, one, two, to whatever limit we have. We split them into different ranges and with the goal that each range have roughly equal, roughly the same amount of weight, right? For example, in this case, all zero have a lot of data. It gets assigned to task T1, T2, T0, T1, T2, and also the tail end to T3. So in the end, which I'm trying to achieve is uh, each task only process a slice of the range, sorted range, and here we balance the weight distribution with continuous ranges. Uh, so that uh, that's why each task only process all is it all zero or all one or all one to one or all two and so on. It works well for both partition and non-partition columns. As I mentioned earlier, the long tail hours, they probably have a little data. So if we look at the weight in terms of traffic distribution, traffic uh, volume, like byte rate or record rate, we may assign hundreds of the long tail hours to a single writer task. If a task, writer task need to handle hundreds of data files, it potentially can become the bottleneck because it takes time to flush all those data files to the distributed storage. That can increase the checkpoint duration and so on that we talked about earlier. If you're familiar with the open file costs in some of the engine like Spark, they're trying to compensate for the fact that there's a the relative high cost to open a file stream, I mean, to retrieve the first byte. So they, if they introduce the open file cost so that they can avoid assign too many small files to a single reader. Similarly, on the right path, we can introduce the closed file cost to compensate for the relative high cost to flush an even small file to the distributed storage. This way we can limit to assigning too many small files to a single writer.
by file count skill, I'm referring to the difference between the number of data files that uh, all the subtask uh, process. Right? If let's say one subtask process one file, another subtask process 100 file, then the skew is between different between one to 100. We can tune this closed file cost to balance between the file count skew and the byte rate skew. For example, as we increase the open file cost, we're gonna see smaller and smaller file count skew because we are assi avoiding assigning too many files to a single writer. But we may see hi much higher byte rate skew because not every data file contains the same amount of traffic. So some file can be very big, some file can be very tiny. So we may, as we increase the close file cost, we may see a much higher byte rate skew. We can tune this parameter to find the sweet spot where both skews are acceptable. With that, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Gang, uh, who's gonna share some of the evaluation results on the, our in, initial uh, uh, implementation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Steven. We set up two injection uh, apps to uh, be the A-B test. In test A, uh, it consumes from Kafka and then write, ice, uh, write to the iceberg. The source operator is chained with the write operator. Job parison is 60 and the checkpoint interval is 10 minutes. In test B, as comparison, we added the shuffle operator between the source operator and the write operator, and the job parison and the checkpoint interval are same as test A. For the other test configuration, the sync iceberg table is partitioned hourly by event time. The benchmark traffic volume is around 250 MB per second. And the event time range is eight days, which is around 192 hours. If the time range is bigger, then the small files problem will be more severe. We measure the results from five perspectives. First, how many data files are being written in one cycle? Second, the data file size distribution. Third, how long it takes to finish one checkpoint. Fourth, the CPU utilization for the injection app. And the last one is the traffic skew among all the iceberg writers. From the flushed files metric at here, you can see that smart shuffling reduced the file number by almost 20 times from 10K to 500, which is 2.5 times of the total partition number. And we should keep in mind that recent hours have a lot of data, so it cannot be handled by a single writer task we need multiple writers to handle the recent partitions and hours, which contains most data. We observe improvement on the file size at all the percentile points. We cannot completely avoid small files since non-tile hours don't have much data. Even in a perfect world, the data file size for the long time hours will still be small. We did a further analyze on the file size distribution. From the histogram, it shows that smart shuffling reduced the small files significantly. On the left side, you can see that without shuffling, there are more than 6,000 files are less than 100 KB. But with shuffling, there are only 83 files. Even for the large file, which size is more than 100 MB on the right path, smart shuffling also helps to almost double the file number from 60 to 110. Doing checkpoint 
if every writer need to write many partitions or hours concurrently, then it also need to upload many files. The more files it handles, the longer time it will take. So we use the checkpoint duration to measure the difference between test A and the test B. From the flash duration metric at here, you can see that the purple line shows without shuffling, checkpoint takes 64 seconds on average. But with shuffling, it only takes eight seconds, which is eight times faster. The shorter checkpoint duration will also bring benefit for the throughput, since no data is being processed during flash. We are going to see the impact of the pause later. In test A, source operator is chained with the writer operator. So the job, it can spend most of the resource on consuming data from Kafka and writing to Iceberg. The data handover between source operator and the writer is a simple method call. So there is no much overhead for test A. In test B, the network shuffling between shuffle operator and the writer operator as additional cost of data serialization, network I.O. for sending and receiving data and deserialization. We want to measure how much overhead that amounts to. We use the CPU utilization for the job to measure the overhead. Without shuffling, the average CPU utilization is 35%. But with shuffling, the CPU utilization is 57%. Here, we trade more resources for larger file size and better data clustering. Because data is usually written once and read many times, so it is usually a good trade-off to spend more resource on the right path, which will also bring benefit for the read performance. And we should keep in mind that for these two tests, they are the simplest streaming job consuming from Kafka and then right to Iceberg. If we want to add much more complex logic, then the CPU increase will likely be much smaller than 62% at here. You may already notice at here, without shuffling, the CPU utilization has some spikes. As we discussed earlier, without shuffling, it need to flush and upload more files which increase the pause period. So at here, the big trough, which is followed by the big catch-up spike, is caused by that. But we don't see such kind of spike for the job with shuffling. After introducing uh, shuffling, every writer will process data for the assigned partitions. We want to measure how much traffic skew net added. We use the writer records rate to measure the traffic skew. Without shuffling, the max record rate is close with the minimum one. And for the uh, shuffling with greedy bin packing algorithm, the max record rate is 59% higher than the minimum record rate. This is caused by the counter greedy algorithm, which distribute the partitions evenly based on the weight to the writers. We are going to have some better algorithm to solve this skewness problem. In the future, first, so now to collect the data statistics, we use the in-memory map to count the records by the key. But if the key has high cardinality, then the in-memory map won't have enough space to store that. Then, in this case, the sketch statistics will be helpful. And second is, we are going to uh, contribute this smart shuffling implementation to the open source, and we have already opened a project on that. This is our design doc. Uh, if you want to know more details about it, feel free to take a look, leave comments and feedback. That's all for today. Yeah, thanks.
We are open for questions. Any questions in the audience? Looks like we have one back there. Uh, this is great. I'm super excited to see this get into open source. It's fantastic work. But you mentioned memory difference between the two tests. Any other differences across resourcing, memory, or you saw me say you did CPU difference, but memory, disk, network? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, obviously because of the shuffle, the network will be higher because without shuffle, you're not doing any network traffic. In terms of the memory, this will help to reduce the memory consumption because we reduce the number of data files each write the task need to open. So definitely avoid actually those auto memory issue we talked about earlier when you do the shuffle. Yeah, CPU definitely be higher because the actual work of serialization, deserialization network. So yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, we have a couple questions. Well, folks may be in here, think of some. Um, from the the internet. Um, one of the questions was uh, earlier in the presentation said basically how much better is this uh, your approach than just partitioning by like the logarithm of, of the hour of the field? By partition by log algorithm. Uh, yeah, you know how you had the like I think this is what they're asking how you had the, the spike with the long tail if you partition by the logarithm of the hour to if that would be a better approach or if you guys considered that approach. Okay, yeah. I think that because business requires the partition to be even the hour. They want to query for hey, okay, I want to query for, for hour 10 of uh, yesterday day by even time. Yeah, if you partition by the log of that value is not really uh, mean, uh, meaningful. Great, thanks. We had another one here. Um, a couple of these, I think <laughs> one of your colleagues might also be in the chat and answering some of the questions. <laughs> Uh, one of the questions is, uh, does Flink Iceberg support merge queries to handle par partial column updates? Uh, today, the Flink Iceberg Sync does not support a partial column write to an Iceberg table. Because when you write it, just say, I want to update one column, it actually today is required to read the existing row, merge them, and then write out. So it is, a, it is not supported today in the Flink Iceberg Sync. This question about your testing strategy, you said, okay, you're using eight days worth of events, right? Uh, is there any reasoning for picking eight days, like any relation to the use case, which is sending the data in different ways, or you can probably expand on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think typically the event time can be much longer. We mentioned it can be months, right? Um, we kind of kept the eight days that businesses, one of the businesses had, hey, we don't have to uh, process the data of all the business. And for this, like industry purpose, uh, we kind of just go on the cap it so that can make, make the compliance a little more simpler. Yeah, but if the time range is wider, the small file problem will be more severe. Actually, this is going to help even better. Okay, next one is a silly question on the on the smart shuffling algorithm. Uh, assuming okay, all these events are coming in different sizes, right? Generally, the randomized algorithm kind of should give you the law, follow the law of averages, and probably give you the benefit, right? Why do you have to kind of create this multiple statistical oriented approach here, right? With the, with the global coordinator, I see a complex design there, right? So did you try a randomized approach and how was the comparison? Basically those statistics can tell you uh, the traffic distribution for every event hour so that you can know how to split them in a balanced way. So you don't assign too many event traffic to a single writer task. So that's basically kind of guided the decision so that we can Limit the number of files while making the traffic relative balance across the writer task. So we have to understand the distribution before we can make this kind of informed decision. Yeah, and also another advantage is uh, because now we calculate the data statistics uh, like dynamically. So if the distribution change, then it will also reflect the uh, change of the distribution and then assign uh, to the writers for different partitions. Oh, yeah, we got another question here. Uh, I might be repeating that question, but um, how is your spark, uh, smart shuffling different than a normal range partitioning um, using the event hour, you know, and then adding like some ID? Well, so this is in the streaming injection path to the iceberg. So we have streaming data coming in Kafka, then we kind of inject the streaming data into the iceberg. This is a, trying to solve that problem in that uh, segment. So yes, in Spark, you can also do sorting, then probably with a kind of similar kind of shuffling uh, approach. 